Well, I, in, uh, I enjoyed Pastor Dustin's message last week. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that yet, uh, John posts them online. He's good. John does that every week. He's, he just doesn't come to, to worship. He, he comes here and then he serves and, and he has some work to get things online when he gets home and, and the, the sermons are online. So if you missed uh, Dustin's message last week, go ahead and listen to it. I really encourage you to do that. Uh, or if you were here and just want to hear it again, it's, it's there. Uh, actually, that message was good, good preparation for today because it dealt with our topic here this morning uh, because he used three different texts, and one of them was Luke chapter 5, which is our next step in our journey through the book of Luke. Yesterday, I, I found out, I learned, I didn't know, but it was uh, Take Your Kids Fishing Day, which is timely because the title of today's sermon is Jesus Wants to Go Fishing with You. Jesus wants to go fishing with you. Isn't that a neat idea? Uh, come on, son. Let's go. I heard a sermon where the speaker asked his audience, what happened when Jesus got in your boat? What happens when Jesus gets in our boat? Jesus got in uh, Peter's boat, and Peter's life was never the same again. When we encounter the living God, things change. Remember, we've used that illustration I heard once before. I didn't make it up. But when you encounter a gnat, your life doesn't change too much. When you have a close encounter with a semi, your life changes, and God is bigger than a semi-truck. When we, when we have a real uh, encounter with the living God, things can't help but change in our lives. Have you ever had an encounter then with Jesus Christ? Has he gotten into your boat? One of the ways you can know is I want you to ask yourself this. Brothers and sisters, ask yourself this. Because you can grow up and be religious. You can, you can be in church because that's where mom and dad brought you. You can uh, go to church because it's a cultural thing. You can, you can say your prayers because you're good at memorization. You can... You can go through all these rituals. You can go through all these routines. You can go through the, the ceremony of faith because, well, that's what our family does. Have you gotten so close to Jesus Christ that His goodness, the beauty of His holiness, revealed to yourself your sin, your fallenness? That's one of the things Dustin was showing us last week, wasn't it? Each time you get close... To the living God, I'm a sinful man. I live among people. I live among a sinful people. Peter, depart from me, Lord. Because I'm bad news. When you get close to God, you can't help but see his perfection. We see ourselves in contrast to that, and we see our own sin. The closer we get to God, it's like one of those lights with a dimmer switch on. If you're sitting in the dark, you don't know you got dirty, dirty hands. You get closer to the light, and you see, wow, I need, <laughs> I need to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. You get closer to God, it reveals more and more about our own sinfulness. We get close to the Holy One, we see we need help. And that's why you can fall on your knees and say, I need a Savior. I need, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin and death? Paul's words, remember? I need a Savior. And if Jesus got into your boat, you know what he does? He starts giving orders. Jesus messes with your life. I think C.S. Lewis called him the great interferer. You can't get close to God without him interfering in your life. That's what he does. He thinks he knows better. He thinks he knows better. Well, I think he's right. God thinks he knows better for your life than I do, than you do. And that's why he calls us to these things. That's why he calls us to a different life. If Jesus got into your boat and messed with your life and told you your business, well, it's what he did when he told Peter. Peter was on the shore. He's washing his nets. It's the end of, he, he worked all night long. 
He's washing his nets, maybe mending his nets. Work is done. They didn't catch anything. Jesus says, go out there and cast again. You're not a fisherman, are you, carpenter boy? <laughs> Jesus messes with your business. And if Jesus got in your boat, messed with your life, told you your business, and you saw and understood, I am a messed up sinner. I'm a sinner. So easy to point the finger out there, isn't it? I'm a sinner. The things I've said, the things I've done, the way I've treated people, the thoughts in my heart, I am messed up. I am wretched. I want to ask you a question. If that happened, what did you do with that knowledge? What did you do with it? Oh, yeah, God's good. I'm messed up. Yep. Moving on. What did you do? Nothing? Or would that situation drive you out of your pride and on to your knees before the living God? Let's turn to Luke chapter 5, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses today. <clears throat> One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gisinaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Uh, so the people were crowding around too much in order to speak the whole crowd. He, he got out on the lake was able to amplify his, amplify his voice towards the shore. And uh, as the tradition in that culture, he sat down in order, to, in order to teach. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. I'm not sure whether there was still an audience at that time. Did the people easily disseminate on the shores? Did, did they just go about their own way? Or were they still watching when Jesus asked Peter to do this? Now, this is after Peter has listened to the entire sermon that Jesus had. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. You notice he argues a little bit with Jesus there. He argues, but in the end he acquiesces. Uh, it's not good to argue with God, right? But... I want you to see something here. He argues with God, but in the end he says, okay, but as your will be done, he acquiesces and it didn't stop. The fact that he kind of struggled with God didn't stop him from receiving the blessing, and that's kind of good news too. He struggles with God here. Of course he shouldn't have. He should have said to Jesus, yes, sir. Jesus says, go. Yep, I'm on my way. Drop down your net. Whatever you say, he's going to do it. Uh When they, had gone, uh, when they had done so, when he had let down their nets, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Which again... His eyes were opened. He realized who Jesus is. He, he, his eyes were opened, and he saw Jesus for who he is. And by contrast, he understood his sin. Brothers and sisters, that's the path for all of us. When we get close to Jesus, we're going to know we need a Savior. When we get close to Jesus, we're going to see God is perfection. And I am far from that. We don't, we don't walk into God's presence and say, look at me, I'm all that. You know, the reason why many of us really aren't close to God is because deep down inside, we really don't think we need a Savior because we're pretty good. Anyways, we're better than that person and that person and these people. And we're so busy looking at how we're better than other folks, we never see where we are in relationship to God. If we get close to God, we're going to see our brokenness. We have to. We have to if God's going to begin a good work in us. So he, he falls before Jesus and says, oh, man, I'm a sinful man. 
For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. I like to say that fast. Zebedee. Simon's partners. Seemed like the, the four of them there. Simon, Peter and his brother and James and John, they all had a business relationship together. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Okay, now the light bulb went on, and now you, oh, that's why today's message is called Jesus Wants to Go Fishing with You. Yep, you guys are quick. <laughs> For, don't be afraid. <laughs> from now on, don't be afraid. Uh, from now on, you're going to be fishers of people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, I don't know if this is a big point or not. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I never noticed it, but I... I was, one pastor was saying that, you notice that when he had heard Jesus preach, he called him master, which meant like te teacher, but when he saw who Jesus was, he saw the miraculous power of Jesus Christ, he had a, this encounter with Jesus, he said, Lord, I'm a sinful man. The idea behind Lord is possession, you own me, I belong to you, uh, Lord, I'm a, I'm a sinful man. J. Vernon McGee said, this does not mean you and I being fisher, fishermen for, God, for Jesus. This does not mean that you and I will catch every fish every time we give out the word. The disciples didn't. But it does mean that for those, it, but it does mean that the one on board must not forget the supreme business of life, which is to fish for the souls of men. The supreme business of life, which is to fish for the souls of men. Well, why is that the supreme business of life? Okay, well, this is, let's walk through this, okay? If there is no God, and we're just on this little piece of, this little rock floating through space, we've got this thin sheet of oxygen around us, this atmosphere, we've got a sun 96 million miles away, think about that, that's been burning for billions of years, that, that shoots out jets of plasma, and the, and the gravity is so intense, it shoots out jets of plasma, it loops them back in, you have these loops on, and it's just burning and burning and burning, it hasn't used up all of its energy yet, and all the grass, all the trees, all the life you see gets its energy from this, and we're just here, and we're just a blip in time, just a small, short blip. Well, I've got to tell you what, it really doesn't matter whether you tell people about Jesus or not. If you're here and, and you're here as an accident and there is no God, it doesn't matter. In fact, it doesn't matter if you go out and steal something or go out and you decide to join ISIS or whatever. Oh, yeah, that matters. Thou shalt not hurt other people. Oh, yeah, who said? Well, I think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I like cheeseburgers. You have your opinion, I have my opinion. And a thousand years from now, 20 years from now, nobody's going to care what we did with our lives. You think I'm lying? Do you care whether any Mayan cheated somebody else in the marketplace down in Central America a thousand years ago? It doesn't affect your life. A thousand years from now, nobody's going to care. Well, yeah, but society, well, how long is the human race going to survive? Oh, it just keeps getting better and better. Okay, let's say we survive. Who knows? Hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, with crazy people on their, with their fingers on, on the triggers for atomic bombs, let's say we go a million years because we're just getting better all the time. Uh, yeah, listen, the universe just keeps going out, just keeps rolling. It's cold, it's dark, it's empty. At some point, everything runs out of energy, just keeps rolling. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to know. The universe won't mourn our loss. The human race will be gone, and it did not matter. Now, let's change this a little bit. Let's say that the whole history of the universe was coming about, and, and God was involved in creation. God would bring everything so that he could, in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, he could pull up another chair and said, please join me in this relationship. And he made man and women in his image. And he made us so that he could love us and we could respond and love him in return. And everything you see around you, 
everything is also we could be in relationship with God. And then let's say, but people decided, I'm going to turn my back on God, and I'm going to do things my own way. God could have turned his back on us too, right? God could have just got out his cosmic eraser and no more earth. But instead, he sets in motion a plan that's going to bring us the Old Testament, that's going to bring us the prophets. Eventually, it's going to bring himself. He's going to come down in the flesh, his son, Jesus Christ, born for the purpose of dying for our sins because our sin separates us from God. He says, I'm going to take care of that problem. And I want to bring you in. And it's this love story where God pursues even though we turn the cold shoulder. God pursues even though we've been disinterested god pursues even though we we think that's more important this is more important this is and god is pursuing us and he's offering us this love a love so strong what do we say every east every easter a love so strong not even death could hold it down nail him to the cross the people he loved the people he came to save nail him to the cross spitting on him and he bursts up out of the grave because he's too strong for that his love is too powerful for that he comes right and he says Take my hand. He's got a nail scar. He says, take my hand. You are made for something better. I created you for paradise. That's why the world feels like it's all messed up all the time. Take my hand. You are made for something better. I will save you. Come with me. And if all of creation is coming down to this moment where God says, I'm going to fix your sin problem. I'm going to fix this death problem. I've done something about it. That's what the cross is all about. Then you tell me what could possibly be more important than going out there and bringing more people in the family. That's why at the start of Jesus' ministry, he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And at the end of his ministry, after he's, he's died, he's resurrected, he's going to return to heaven, he says to his followers, go and tell everybody and teach them to obey everything I've te- taught you. Go out, bring more people in. Jesus is all about growing the family. He's all about bringing more people into this this loving relationship that we were created for in the first place. But Paul Harvey said this, too many Christians are no longer fishers of men, but think of themselves as keepers of the aquarium. (laughs) We're not here to be a holy huddle. We love each other. We love each other. We love to see each other every Sunday. But you know there's a danger when a church is so comfortable seeing them the people they love week after week, that they're not comfortable when somebody new comes in the door. They're not comfortable about going out and loving people through those doors. Jesus said, from now on, you're going to be fishers of men. Well, he said that just to those, to, to Peter. He just said that to the apostles. Well, come off it, guys. Jesus came to restore a lost world. He died to pay for people's sins. He commanded that we go out. It's dear to his heart. Do you think it's different today? Do you think if Jesus was in this room, he would say, no, 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 no. Enjoy the worship service. Enjoy the music. Enjoy the potlucks. But I know it's uncomfortable for you. It's kind of uncomfortable for me on that cross, to tell you the truth. And then he chuckles. Or do you think Jesus would say, go out there, go, tell everybody, cast those nets wide, bring in anybody. Dustin Hinton, again, guest preacher last week, uh, it's a paraphrase, he said, because Peter encountered the living God, Peter encountered the living God and he fell on his knees, thousands were saved. Thousands came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the first church was planted in Jerusalem because because of an unclean man sitting before the Lord was saved. Unclean? Done some things in your life you're not proud of? Had Had some really nasty thoughts about maybe other people in the church, maybe towards your spouse. Boy, You know, we say, why can't the world just get along when we can't even get along with our own spouses and we say things that, boy, why did I ever say that? We we do things, vindictive things to the people we care about. And then we say, well, why can't the world get along? Our own homes are war zones. Have you recognized your own sin? Have you gotten close to Jesus? So close to Jesus that you know you need a Savior. Here's the good news. The bad news is, yeah, you're a sinner. The Bible is very clear. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. 
where sin has separated us from the living God. We're very far from God. The good news is that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. And he never says, I'll take you and you and you, but not you, sister. I'll, uh, I like you people, but you, brother, no. Please, Jesus, forgive me. No. He has never said that. Anybody who comes to him and says, I'm, I see my brokenness and I see you're so good and I want to I be with you. I want to be with you. I want, I want your life. I want to see things from your perspective. I want to I go to work with you, Daddy. I want to go fishing with you. There has been no person who ever came to Jesus with a repentant and broken heart. And Jesus says, no, I won't take you. The good news is Jesus takes everybody. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've gone through, what you are going through. Jesus will take you. This chance meeting, chance. I mean, you put it in italics and put quotation marks around it, then on the line and put it in bold. This chance meeting with Jesus forever... It, it, the Bible says Jesus is walking along the shore, you know, <laughs> sees a couple guys. This chance meeting with Jesus forever changed Peter's life. And thousands of people were saved. Not just his life was changed because he gave his heart to Jesus. He gave his life, he gave his soul to Jesus. Other people's lives were changed too. Because an unclean person found himself sitting before holy God. Things changed for a lot of other people, too. Who would be blessed by your testimony? Who might think about Jesus in a different light if your life was turned upside down because of Jesus Christ? Now, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but the Holy Spirit is telling you, maybe I haven't taken some parts of my faith seriously enough. Or maybe you've been just going through the rituals, going to church, going through the routine, but You've never turned your life over to God yet. You've never said, I need this forgiveness. I want to follow you. I give you my life. And that's never happened. Who around you would be blown away to see you living and loving, filled with the joy of the Lord, living your life to encourage and bless other people? Think about what Jesus Christ can do through another sinner, man or woman who falls at his feet and says, you are the Lord, you are my Lord. This chance meeting changed Peter's life forever, and it changed the lives of the people that Peter impacted. But you know, something else changed. You know what changed? This chance encounter, Jesus gets on his boat, says, cast your nets on the other side. You know what changed? How, when, where Peter would die. Everything changed this moment on a boat. Jesus gets on a boat, he sees Jesus, he falls on his knees. Lord, I'm unclean. Everything in his life changed, including how, when, and where Peter would die. And he died a brutal death. History tells us Jesus, uh, history tells that Peter was killed for his faith in Rome. Tradition tells us that he was hung on a cross in Rome, and one tradition says probably upside down because he says, I'm not worthy to experience the same death that my Lord and Savior experienced. Probably in the year 64 AD, approximately 30 years after Christ's death and resurrection, so three decades, he's still preaching the message, he's still trying to bring people in his family. In the year 64 A.D., three months after a huge fire, you maybe you've heard, remember that idea of Nero fiddling while Rome burns? You've heard that image before? Rome burnt in 64 AD. AD. Three months later, Nero uh, decides to blame the Christians. He wants to say, the Christians burnt down the city, which is extraordinarily likely if you read the New Testament. In, in Nero, uh, who was insane and wicked and diabolical, uh, needed to take the heat off of himself. So he found, what does he do? What does every bully do in the playground? 
finds somebody that's unpopular and picks on them to boost his own prestige. You know why that works? Because we're sinners. That should not work. That should not work. So Nero decides to go after the Christians. He persecutes and he kills many, many, many Christians at this time. And one of the believers that he kills is Peter. What a tragic death. To be hammered to a cross. And probably he didn't go quickly because when you die on a cross like this, you die of asphyxiation. When you die upside down with the blood in your head and your ears pounding, you can still breathe. You're hanging on that cross for a long time. Tragic death. He ended up dying a cruel death, an unfair death, being persecuted for his faith, his good faith. He left his life. Listen, we always have this equation in our mind. If I do boom, 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 then God's going to be boom, 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 boom. He never promises that in Scripture, but that's the way we operate. So Peter, what did Peter do? He left his lifestyle. He left probably his parents' business. He had probably inherited it. He, he, like Dustin pointed out last week, he had the catch of a lifetime. And he left it behind. He met Jesus. Jesus says, come with me. I'm going to teach you to fish for men. He leaves his business. He endured years, 30 years after Christ is gone of sacrifice and hardship living his life in order to love other people, trying to obey God, trying to do the right thing. And what did it get him? Upside down, head throbbing, and he's going to be killed by some insane punk, the Roman Empire, emperor, who can do as he pleases because he's the Roman emperor. Murdered by a nasty, demented twisted Emperor Nero it gets worse not only is he suffering he's got his name was dragged through the mud he got blamed for something he didn't do I'm dying they say I burnt down the city he didn't get commended for all the years of doing good this is not fair. Who, who thinks this is fair? This is not fair. It did not end up fair for Peter. He is killed for a crime he didn't do because, again, because of a mentally and emotionally deranged pagan emperor who thought he was a god and he used the Christians as a scapegoat to take some of the heat off of himself. That's about as lousy a way to go as you can find. Is that a tragic death? Well, guess what? We've got a contemporary of Peter who actually wrote about Peter's death. A contemporary. His name is Clement of Rome. And he has the name Clement of Rome because his parents named him Clement and he lived in the city of Rome, so he was Clement of Rome. I can always get into the minutia for you. <laughs> Clement of Rome didn't think that Peter's death was tragic. He wrote sometime before 100 A.D. Some people think it was as early as 80 A.D., in other words, Clement is writing, think about this, before the New Testament is done writing. And he's writing about Peter. And Clement wrote in his letter to the Corinthian church. He, he's talking about all these believers in the Old Testament that died because of their faith. Okay? He says, but let's stop talking about those old guys. It, quote, let us take the noble examples of our own generation. Isn't that beautiful? He's writing before the New Testament is completed. He's saying, well, let's use the examples from our own generation. Through jealousy and envy, the greatest and most just pillars of the church were persecuted and came even unto death. Peter, though uh, through unjust envy, endured not one or two, but many labors, and at last, having delivered his testimony, departed unto the place of glory due him. Clement of Rome, writing for the New Testament's done, being written, says, let's take an example of faith from our own generation. Remember Peter, this pillar of the faith? Unjust, unfair. He gave his testimony. He was found faithful to the end, and then he departed to glory. 
he went right into glory. And that was per the perspective of this first generation, this second generation of Christians. So the Christians of Peter's generation saw him as a great man who did mighty things for God. Then he died, and then he was received into heaven. Not tragic at all, I guess. Not tragic at all, if you think about it from God's perspective. What do we say? What does the Bible say? God rejoices in the death of his saints because he wants to bring us home. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked because they'll be eternally separated from him. Not tragic at all, especially when you compare how he could have died. Oh, it's such so a Jesus got into that boat, and what did it get him? He ended up getting crucified upside down. Well, how else could his life have gone? Well, he's out on a boat all the time. Storm could have come, and he's the highest thing on the lake. He got hit by lightning. Well, let's say he lives a long, long life, and he ends up with cancer or heart disease or, or something. And he's laying in bed, and he's got a few people around him who love him. A good life, but an unhappy end to a life which is which the primary distinction was that he missed the boat, he missed Christ, missed the fishing trip. Isn't that more tragic? If the most defining moment of his life is Jesus said, come, be a fisherman, uh, be a fisher of men. He says, no, I'm going to stay casting nets. Now, please listen. I'm not saying that everybody's got to leave their business. I'm not saying that everybody's going to leave their job. I'm going to say, as you go about your life, are you fishing for men? As you go about your life, where God has placed you, are you sharing your faith? Are you casting those nets wide? Or is the biggest distinction in my life and your life going to be, no, Jesus, I'd rather not fish. Missing this opportunity to go on a fishing trip with our wonderful Lord and Savior who loved us enough to die for us. And he says, I want you to live for me. I want you to use your life to let other people know about what I've done on the cross. Let other people know how good I am. Let other people know that heaven's doors are wide open and anybody can go. They need to see their brokenness. They need to see their sin. They come to me and I will forgive. I will let them in. Jesus wants to go fishing with you. Don't miss out. Don't sulk in the corner. Don't pout. Don't get distracted by Gilligan's Island. That's my go-to TV show. All these things. You don't want to be in that bed. You, you're going to die anyways. Life is going to be miserable anyways. Either life is miserable and you're all alone and your suffering means nothing because you're going to have suffering either way. So either your suffering is used for God or it's used for nothing. You're going to die anyways. You want to look back and say, God called and I answered. God called and I answered. God said, cast the, cast the nets wide and that's what I tried to do all my life. Or you're going to say, God called, and I watched the Gilligan's Island Marathon again and again. Brothers and sisters, don't ever think God can't use somebody like you. Isn't that a feeling we have sometimes? Well, I'm too ornery. Well, I'm not smart enough. Well, I don't have a, a very good testimony. I saved it when I was a little kid. Well, you don't know the things I've done, Pastor. I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too short, I'm too ugly, whatever. Whatever it is we tell ourselves. Don't ever tell yourself God can't use someone like you. He's the one who called you, and he's the one who says, let's go fishing. Charles H. Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, right? He's always good for a good quote. Commenting on, Christ, commenting on Christ's invitation to go fishing with him, had this to say. Listen, listen to what Spurgeon has to say. We should repent of what we've been, but rejoice in what we may be. It is not, follow me because of what you are already. It is not, follow me because you may make something of yourselves, but follow me because of what I will make of you. I will make you a fisher of men. 
Verily, I might say of each of us, as soon as we are converted, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. When you're first converted, it has not yet appeared what God's going to do in your life. It does not seem a likely thing that lowly fishermen would develop into apostles. Is that an understatement or what? It does not seem a likely thing that lowly fishermen would develop into apostles, that men so handy with the net would be quite as much at home in preaching sermons and instructing converts. One would have said, how can these things be? You cannot make founders of churches out of peasants from Galilee. I was wondering if Spurgeon wanted that to rhyme. How can these things be? You cannot make founders of churches out of peasants of Galilee. That is exactly what Christ did. And when we are brought low in the sight of God, brought low like Peter on his knees, when we are brought low in the sight of God by a sense of our own unworthiness, we may feel encouraged to follow Jesus because of what he can make us. Amen? So, brothers and sisters, what are we doing with our life? You know, the thing about Jesus is he likes to go fishing on sunny days, on overcast days, on windy days, on cloudy days, when the sun's just right, when things are going well in our life, when things aren't going so well in our life. He says, let's go fishing. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of down. Let's go fishing. I don't know, Lord. I've got a lot of bills to pay. Let's go fishing. Got to go to work. Yeah, I meant let's go fishing at work. You know, <laughs> Get at work and start telling people about Jesus. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a party this evening with my neighbors. Fishing time. What are you doing with your life? What do you feel like God is calling you to drop and leave behind? I've got to drop this. this. This situation, that's not good. This is keeping me from following God as I should. That situation is keeping me from following good. I've, I've been spending too much time here, spending too much money with that. What do we need to drop and leave behind in order to answer that call? Because the Lord is calling you. Come on, sister. Come on, brother. Let's cast the net in. Let's see. Let's see who we can catch today. And you know what? That is a good life. That's a good life. To go fishing with your dad, to go fishing with your Heavenly Father, to go fishing with your Lord, that's a good life, and we don't want to miss out. So Jesus wants to go fishing with you. He wants to go fishing with me. And we're going to say, yes, Lord, here I am. Yes, Lord, here I am. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.org. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.